Welcome to the Hallelujah House, a home for Christian creatives. Join Tammy Carter Adams in the living room and get comfortable as she shares biblical insights for a creative life. Welcome home. Welcome back to the living room. This is Tammy Carter Adams. And as you get settled in, I hope you have something hot to drink and get comfortable with me. I'd like to take a minute to announce what's been going on over at the house. If you don't know what the house is, it's thehallelujahhouse.com. That's our our website, and there we post blog posts. And last week, we have rooms in the, in the house and in the kitchen. We posted a healthy pumpkin latte recipe for you guys to enjoy with your family. We also gave you a children's healthy recipe, like with decaf coffee. We made this with our kids. Um, at our farmhouse one weekend and um, it was delicious and it has uses real pumpkin and not artificial flavors and a lot of sugar so head over there and get that recipe uh, there's a printable for you Um, we're also going to be doing artist roundup soon so if you're an artist if you're a christian artist and you want to share your work and your testimony um, and it doesn't have to be a religious themed art as long as it's you know it goes along with our our Christian faith, and it's not anything that's got a worldview. Um, send me a link. Send me a, send me a link to your work, and send me something about your testimony, because I would love to feature you in an article on the house. I also want to let you guys know that every Monday on our private Facebook group, we have prayer requests. So if you're not on our private Facebook group, go head over to the Hallelujah House again. And um, every Monday we post our prayers. And you don't have to wait till Monday. If you have an urgent prayer request, we have a lot of prayer warriors on there um, that want to pray for you. So, And you don't need to tell us what your prayer request is. God knows. He knows what's on your heart and your mind and what's giving you anxiety. And, and, he will, um, and we will definitely pray for you by name. So head over there and do that if you like. Um, today is the second podcast of our fall season thriving in God's abundance and this and if you have not heard podcast number one um, I encourage you to head over there and listen to that but I do want to admit something this week Um, after I posted last week's blog um, a good friend of mine and I'm not going to say her name (laughs) Liz Liz Hammond Um, she sent me a text and she told me it sounded like I'd been, I was reading it. She said that it just lacked, um, vulnerability when I read it. Okay. And I think I decided to read it. I did read it. She was, she was right about that. And it probably did sound like I read it. Um, I had typed it out and I felt like it was such a deeply personal thing that I just, I didn't want to get too emotional so it was easier for me to get through that to in reading it and so if you haven't heard it I'm not going to retape it unread but head over there and um, and listen to that so that you know why we're covering this striving versus thriving um, subject during this season okay and we're going to get started I want to just pray father God I just lift those up that are in the living room today listening to the podcast Lord if there's anything they're struggling with, that you will give them peace, calm their anxieties, and help them to, um, just to help them to understand your word today. And I pray any words I say that are yours, and they glorify you, and they draw people to you, Lord. And they are truth, Lord. Be with us today. We love you, and thank you for everything you bless us with. In your name, amen. Okay. So, I think I, I have this. This is our, as I said, is our second podcast in thriving in God's abundance. But in order for us to get further into thriving, what thriving looks like, I think it's very important first that we discuss who God is. Okay, not who He is to us, but who God is. And what what do I mean by that? I don't mean that God is not a personal God to you. Yes, He is. But what I mean by that 
is we can't filter God through our feelings, our experiences, our false teaching, our circumstances. Because we are human, sometimes we can have a skewed view of who God is. So I want to touch base on some of the the non-biblical ways the world sees God and 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 discuss where those possibly could have come from. Okay, it can be it can come from you know, your education or your upbringing. Um, so we're going to discuss this. I've named them, and I've written a, a blog post about this before, but this I'm going to get more in depth with it here. But I want to start by saying um, this quote by A.W. Tozer, who stated, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'm going to say that again. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Because your, your view of who God is, if it's skewed, can make you fall into the trap of striving. And it can affect your relationship and thriving in God's abundance, right? So let's discuss some faulty ways we can view the God, the Father, today. And I want to break down all um, the faults with these these personifications okay so we're gonna start with the first one and that's zeus so i'm named this one zeus if you view god as a pagan greek god like zeus you're gonna see him as someone who's sitting up on the throne on his throne waiting for you to sin so he can strike you with a bolt of lightning oh i know what it's like to be struck by lightning i i, I can't remember if i've ever shared this because i don't remember all the stories I share um, in the past on either blog or podcast. I'm sure I've shared this sometime before, but when I was five years old, I was struck by lightning on my father's boat. We had invited this family to come aboard the boat with us after church, and we were going to have lunch and and just enjoy being out on the water. And their son was in my Sunday school class, and I had a serious girl crush on him. He had the, he looked like a brown headed John Denver and he had these thick glasses that made his eyes, his squinty eyes appear much larger than what they were. And I was crushing to the point I had butterflies in my tummy. I'd try to sit with him right next to him every Sunday school class. And so, of course, I put myself right beside him on the boat and I was sitting um, by the, where the water was spraying and we were on the bench together, and I was leaning over the side and putting my hand in the water, and I kept looking back to make sure he's watching because I was trying to impress him. And um, and he's just smiling, and then this storm cloud came over the boat. It was summertime, hot summer. A lightning came down, struck the crab pot that was beside our boat, bounced off the metal, and it grounded itself in my arm. And it was painful, painful. And I just, I never... I don't, I don't think I've ever seen my father that scared. He he grabbed us all, put us all in the little um, cabin area of the boat. And let me just say the next Sunday, I sat as far away from that boy as, as I could possibly get because I honestly believe God struck me by lightning for flirting. And I hung on to that leaf, that, that leaf, that leaf, it's fall, that belief for a long time after. Okay, so if you're like me and you've gone through a period of your life viewing God as Zeus, you may have been a, have raised you may have been raised in a legalistic church environment, home life, or even a Christian school where little grace was given. Um, typically, in a legalistic home life, you would see that mistakes are punished from a place of anger, not love, and you know, possibly your bad behavior was brought up after, you know, there wasn't much forgiveness there and you're, and it was hung over your head and it was brought up at the family dinners and, and kind of re, you were reminded of those mistakes that you've made so that you don't do it again. Right. You may have had a, um, home life also where your affection was doled out in response to good behavior and performance. So you earned good grades and you've got that pat on the head whenever you earn good grades and this would in turn teach you that you have to earn love right it's not unconditional you would have to earn it so some people have been raised in this home life may have gotten this idea of god that he is he is sitting up there just waiting for you to screw up or 
He's only going to give you love when you earn it. And and you can see how this can turn into a striving situation, right? A striving lifestyle to earn God's favor. But here's the truth. This totally goes against the gospel. Um, Your goodness will never earn salvation, God's love or his favor. Thomas Watson said, God does not justify us because we are worthy but justifying us makes us worthy. I believe there's lots of false teaching that, that kind of coincides with this view of God. And you can see that in Mormonism and Jehovah witnesses and other religious movements that kind of they're outside of gra- They're outside of grace and they fall prey to this. They believe that they do this, this, and this. If any religion tells you, you have to do this, this, and this, and this in order to receive God's love or or God's salvation, and it's not a free gift, then you need to run, run, because that goes totally against the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember as a teen, a young boy, I say Jehovah Witness because I had a, I had a young boy and, a, and an elderly gentleman ring my doorbell as a teenager, and when I told them I wasn't interested in their message because I knew who they were, my parents had warned me, if a Jehovah Witness comes to the door, you do not let them in the house. You do not, you tell them you're not, you're not interested in listening to them because they, they knew I was young in my faith and, and I could fall prey to some false teaching. So they came to the door. I told them who, that I was, I was a believer and I was a Baptist. <laughs> so the man lifted his head haughtily, uh, you know, very prideful. And he stated, well, what does John 3.16 say? You Baptists do not follow John 3.16. And I kind of looked at him like, what are you talking about? And this was what he said. For God the, loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone doing works for him might not be destroyed but have everlasting life. Okay. And, and according to their New World Translation, the Bible they use in the Jehovah Witness Church, it states that everyone exercising faith in him has everlasting life. But that's, an, that's a mistra- mistranslation of God's word because we can't earn it, right? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that who, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. His love for us was costly, and he wanted us to have a direct access to him through Jesus, his son, okay? And through Jesus, if you, if we, once we believe in Jesus, you believe that Jesus is God, right? And he took on the sins, your sins on that cross, and he claimed it is finished. He has completed it. Then you're going to receive, you receive the Holy Spirit, and that is your communication. He communicates from the Father what he wants you to know. God's, we can't understand the language of the Father. So basically, he's kind of our translator, and he's with us. He is the gift, okay? He is the spirit of truth. And it's through Jesus that we have this communication through his death on that cross, okay, and his resurrection, Okay, so I did tell that boy, young boy, I did look at him and tell him the, the correct version of John three sixteen, And I could see the man was getting angry with me as I was, you know, telling him, thank goodness they picked a verse that a teenager would, a young teenager would know, because I had very limited verses that I had mem- put in memorization at the time. So I'm so thankful that I knew that one, that I could, I could tell him, and I told him, please go get yourself a, a, a different translation Bible because obviously I didn't even know they had their own translation. I said, obviously this is your translation is screwed, screwed up. So, all right. So Paul points out that it's not by our works that we're counted as righteous, but by our faith. So if you're struggling in this area, there is a chapter I think that you should meditate over and read and just really ask, pray and ask God to help you understand the concept of grace, okay, the God and the gospel message, and that's Romans 4, okay, and pray that God re- releases you from that mindset that you have to strive and strive and strive to earn his favor. I shared last podcast that I got stuck in a striving mentality from survivor guilt, okay, 
And that can happen. It can, anything can trigger you to, to land on the striving. And, you know, and God has sent me, God kept talking to me about striving, but I kept pushing it away. But I'm not going to go back into that. I want you to go back and listen to that if you haven't. Okay. And it's a good example of, and I, and I also show you different examples of other things that can get us into the striving mindset. There's another passage I want to point out is, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 8.38. And that includes any mistakes you've made. Okay? God loves you. He is. He, there is nothing that can make him love you anymore. Okay? And he desires a deep personal relationship with you. It does not mean, this does not mean that he doesn't discipline on the flip side of this. He does discipline us because he, and he, and he states in his word that he disciplines those he loves. So if you're being disciplined right now because of, so you've fallen into a sin pattern or you become prideful or, you know, anything, you know, understand this, that that is his love for you. Just like a, a child to a father, a father to a child, Right. All right, let's move on. Another way we can see God, the second way we can fall trap in, in, in a skewed view of way we can see God is by, and I'm going to title this, Alexa. If you see the Father as Alexa, you tend to expect a cherry on top kind of life if you follow God. And you may just get that cherry and because... You know, if it's his will for you to have a cherry on top kind of life, I think we all have some of that in our life. But we also go through some some tra- tragedies. We go through some heartache. We go through some hardships. And it's in those things that, that God builds our faith, right? He uses these as a tool to build your faith up. I believe in this type of life, there's a tendency here not to recognize things like self-indulgence, materialism, love of money, and pride of life as a sin. Instead, we look at these things as blessings, okay? This group swings so much towards grace that there's a tendency to take advantage of God's grace. It's kind of a, think about this, it's a name it and claim it. It's kind of you put your coins in and you think God should bless you with whatever you're asking him for. And I think that this leaves little room for God's will. Okay. Any, not everything we ask for, we're going to get. Sometimes the answer is no. And a lot of times that's to protect us. Okay. Sometimes it's, you know, I don't know why there, there are times where God says no to us. Right. But We need to just accept that he knows what he's doing and rest. I mean, we should, if you have true faith in God, that no is a blessing. And you're going to praise him through the no's. Okay. I praise you, Lord, that you saved me from that, the thing I thought I wanted, right? This group leans, they tend to like the prosperity doctrine, church. Think of, think about Joel Olstein. Why has Joel Olstein become so popular today? People are attracted to his teaching because he doesn't discuss topics like confession of sin or hell. He tends to be a positivity pastor, speaking only about the positivity of grace, okay? But there's more facets to God's character, a lot more, many more facets to God's character than than just the positive, um, what we view as positive. Okay. That God's jealous. Okay. He's, he's, he has a a righteous jealousy. Okay. He, um, his judge, he's a judge, right? His judgment, his holiness, his wrath, all of that is part of God's character. And we as followers of Christ need to come before the father with a humble, repentant heart, continually checking in with him 
You know, so if we know we've done something that mourned the Holy Spirit inside of you and you feel that conviction, that little angst inside of you, go to the Father and tell him, I am so sorry and turn away from that thing and repent and move forward and and walk away from it, that sin, and don't do it anymore. Repenting is not just confessing it, but it's also turning away from that thing that you're repenting of. I think here there was a shift in parenting when I was bringing up my boys. I remember this so clearly, and I felt like I was kind of like the oddball mom that wasn't raising my boys where every little thing they did, I was praising them. I just thought that was just, to me, that just was so weird. I was raised, you know, my butt got beat. I'm just going to say it, okay? And, um, And I'm not, I am not against spanking, but... There was a, like this positivity thing where it was on the extreme from spent from dis- disciplining. It was almost like they were over. These kids were overly praised for every little thing they did. I remember I had a neighbor, and I'll stand in the yard, and her daughter loved doing cartwheels, and her and I would be talking, and she would shush me mid sentence. Oh, hold on, hold on, Tammy. Yes, that. That 50th cartwheel was so much better than the 49th you just did. And I thought it was so weird. I'm like, oh my goodness. What what kind of adult is this child going to grow up to be? She's going to go into the world and expect everyone's going to praise every little thing she does. I imagine she praised her for going to the potty all through her elementary school years. But... Maybe that's a little extreme, but that was kind of what it was like um, in this extreme positivity, okay? They were so concerned about their child's self-esteem. Now, what happens is they get out in the world, they realize that they are not the center of attention all the time, they're, that, that they're not getting praised by their bosses or by their professors or by their teachers for every little thing that they do, and they seem to become very fragile adults and they, and they can be crushed. Okay. I think that back then it was taught that be positive, be so, so positive. Now, I mean, I praised, I want you to know I did praise my boys, but it was for things that I felt like they deserved praise on. You know, it wasn't for um, going to the potty, you know, and, and I mean, once they learned, of course, I, I did praise them when they did it, when we were first learning, but, um, but it was for, you know, for achievements that I knew that they worked hard at, right? You praise your kids for things that you know that they're working hard at and you discipline them when they're, when in love, when, when they've messed up, you know, when they've sinned against you and you know, when they're being defiant, they get that look in their eye, right? And they try to challenge you. Um, and they, you know, when they're little, you say, do not touch. And they get that look in their eye and they're going to put their finger out and they're going to try to touch it anyway. That's when you have to nip it in the bud. You have to discipline. Okay. I don't know how I ended up on all this subject. But anyway, I want to say this, that, that too often this type of parenting makes the kids so comfortable. They, they don't want them disappointed ever. They want them comfortable. And God, I want you to know that God is not there to serve us and keep us comfortable. If our lives are going to produce true fruit for the sake of the gospel, we need to expect our crosses, that he's going to give us crosses to carry. We're each going to have to go through those valleys, right? And and we're each going to have those that dark shadows and those mountains hanging over us. But those things are what builds our character. It builds our faith in God. It allows God to lean in close into our lives. Okay. How many of you have been, have gone through an illness? Didn't you feel like, I just remember when, when I heard I had cancer and I rem- every night I laid in the bed and I, you know, people didn't understand. They don't understand unless you've heard you have cancer. And they tried, you know, they tried to. They try, you know, they want to talk about it all day, first of all. And you're like, you just want to not think about it. But I remember going to bed and laying in the bed and talking to my Lord about it. And I love that song, You're a Good, Good Father. And I played, I can't tell you how many nights I would put my earphones on and I would play that song 
and just say the words in my mind. I said, I know I, my circumstances are, I am, I am sick, Lord, but you are still a good, good father. It did not affect my opinion of God, right? And maybe I, yeah, you, you go through like, that's after you get out of the little, the sad part and the, hang, and the anger part. You know, there are phases that you have to kind of go through. But in my mind, in my heart, I still knew God was good. God was good. I felt his presence. I felt him closer to me at, in those nights because I praised him. I, I told him he was good and I loved him no matter what. And when you, when you do that, when you praise God in that illness, and I'm not telling you I am perfect that I've done this every time I've faced obstacles and things like things of that nature, but I just, I, I, I kind of felt like I was in this little, this little cocoon that I, with, with the Lord during that time at night, especially it was hard to sleep because you know, all those fears the enemies put, the enemy comes and puts in your head And so I would just lay there and I would just start to praise God. And when I did, those fears would go away. It would, and I could sleep. God would just fill me with his peace. And I hope you have that relationship with the father. If I could, if I could stress something to you today, God is so, so good and he loves you and he wants that. He wants to lean in close to you when you're going through these difficult seasons. And I just pray that you do that. All right. Christ tells us in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Also in Matthew 10, 38, he tells us, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We are not to follow Jesus for earthly gain. And that's what the, that's what this is about. Alexa v- version of God is you're following Jesus for an earthly gain. We follow him simply because we desire a close relationship with him and we love him. Okay. I love this passage in Luke because this is where I think we as, we as believers need to ask ourselves, is Jesus enough? If we were to, if God would ask us to walk away from all our comfort and our material possessions, would he be enough? And the disciples thought so, and I'm going to prove it to you. In Luke 5, I want you to, to go with me. Jesus calls the first disciples. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, He was standing by the lake of Jacinarab. I don't know how to pronounce that, so we're going to skip one. And he saw two boats by two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, "Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch." And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to the partners in the boat and the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. See, he realized that Jesus was God when he saw this miracle. He realized who Jesus was. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So I want to point out they left everything. They left their fish and they left their expensive nets behind even after they had tried to catch all this fish and they were willing to leave it all and follow Jesus. Are we willing, would we be willing to leave it all if we believe that God is there to be our Alexa, 
to be our comforter all the time. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about spiritually comforting, but I'm talking about materialistic, always giving us comforts, okay? And what happens when we believe this? When we believe, when we see this vision of God, we're, what's going to happen is we are going to, I believe a lot of people fall away when things start to get rough in their life. They stop believing that, that God is really there when their prayers aren't answered. There is a tendency to leave the faith. So God is not our Alexa. The last one is the old man upstairs. If you hold this belief, you will think God is too busy to be bothered by you, that he's not involved in your life. He has too many things looking out for. He's looking out for too many other things and too many balls in the air that, um, that you know, he just doesn't have time to worry about your personal matters, right? You, we see this in a lot of pagan religions, Um where they bring like their offering to the altar and they plead and beg with their deity, like in Hinduism. If they have time, please, please answer my prayer. Okay. But I want to point something out to you. The difference here between Jesus, a lot of people say all, all paths, some people, many people believe all paths lead to he- leads to heaven. But the difference between the little G's And the big G is this. Your creator of the universe loved you so much that he came in flesh to live amongst us. He learned what it was like to be hungry. He learned what it was like to be sad, feel pain. He learned what it was like to be tired, feel rejection, humiliation. He was tortured and killed. What other little G has done this for you? For those that might be listening in that could be, you know, following Hinduism or, you know, I had a friend that worshiped all three. She would, she had altars to everything. And I've talked about her before and she ended up coming to know the true God of the universe, Jesus, through Jesus Christ. She ended up accepting Jesus as her personal savior and following Jesus and believing in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you why she became a believer in Jesus Christ because it hit her that God had been call- drawing her to him. There was a time where she was, you know, she had brain cancer and she was driving herself to go to the grocery store while under chemotherapy treatment for this brain cancer. And she said she was going towards the grocery store and there was a, all these cars pulling into a parking lot. And I'll never forget the story of this. I think this is so powerful. And this is a person that was, whose father was Muslim, mother Catholic. And, um, and she, was, she had a lot of family members who were Hindus, okay? So she was exposed to everything. And she prayed to every single God and believed all paths le- led to heaven. Okay. But this particular day, she's driving to the go to the grocery store and the wheel in her hands, the, the, the automobile wheel turned into a parking lot. She said it was as if the, it just turned under my hands in my hands and in it, my car just parked. And I sat, I sat, she sat in the car wondering what in the world just happened and why am I here? And then people were getting out of their cars and walking into a building. So she decided to follow. She follows the crowd in. And sure enough, she's sitting in a church. Okay. And so she said, I didn't understand what the pastor was speaking about, but she sure loved the music. And God drew her to him through that music. And so the next Sunday, she went again. The next Sunday, she went again. But she didn't understand the message of Jesus and salvation until she came into my home and began working, um, taking care of my baby for me. And, and I, I let her to Lord, basically speaking to her about the, the gospel message. Okay. And she ended up turning away from the little G's and, and accepting the father who had been drawing her to him. Isn't that amazing? 
Isn't that amazing? So maybe you've had some experiences in your life. Somebody has said something to you about Jesus and you've kind of pushed it away. I, that is God bring and inviting you to him. And I hope that you will reconsider. The word of the Lord tells us he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows you by name. He knows your heart and your thoughts. Here's another one. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Second Chronicles 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Proverbs 16, 9. God desires a relationship with you and me, personal, a personal relationship. He wants you to tell him about it your day. He is not one that's the old man upstairs who just don't have time for you. Okay? So I hope that you will um, take time, spend time in his word, spend time praying to the Lord. Stop neglecting your relationship. Sometimes I'll be honest, I've got to remind myself, although I serve a great God who's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, that his desire from the beginning of creation was to walk in the garden alongside us. He wanted that perfect relationship with us. You know, of course, we know how the story went. Sin came into the world and kind of broke, um, put a veil between me and God. But Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, of course. His son, Jesus, takes on the sin of the world. Jesus is God in flesh. There are three parts to God. God the Father, God the Son is Jesus, God the Holy Spirit. We know this to be true. And Jesus took on the sins. And he was, because it required a blood sacrifice, so all of our sins can be placed on that cross. And we have to accept that gift of, of grace, the gift of salvation. Have you accepted it? Have you accepted it? Do you believe in the power of the cross? You know, I, I believe, firmly believe that if you have this view of God, that maybe your parents were disinterested in your life, that you were kind of, they were preoccupied. You, you weren't given a lot of attention or affection, and um, you had to seek the attention of your parents, maybe. Or you, you didn't have parents growing up. Maybe, maybe you were passed around um, in like foster in a foster care situation. Vanessa, this girl I'm telling you the story about, she was passed around in a, in a foster care situation. But here's the truth. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Psalms 145, 18. Now, who is truth? Jesus is truth. Here's another one. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Psalms 147.3. So if you're believing that God is not interested in your life, that he's just the old man upstairs looking over the whole world and just juggling things and trying to keep everything in working order, then I encourage you to read the book of Psalms and journal each time in, in the verses where the Lord talks, shows his love for you. Journal all the verses that you see in ways that the Lord shows his love for you, like those two examples I just shared here. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. So we've come to the correct way of seeing God. And I've said it throughout this whole teaching. I keep referring to God as the Father, Abba, Father. If you see him as your father, a good, good father, then you're going to be respectful, okay? You're going to be relational. You're going to see him that he disciplines. He gives good gifts. He rejoices over our successes. He loves us with a perfect love. A good father sacrifices on behalf of his children and much, much more. And I believe the best illustration that Jesus gives us for Abba, Father, is in the story of the prodigal son. And we're going to read that right now. And we're going to close with this story. So let's turn to Luke 15. And it starts 
and verse 11. The parable of the prodigal son. There was a man who had two sons, and the youngest of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of the father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. All right, I'm going to not go into the older son's part. Um, I am going to link, though, one of our older blog posts that we have posted about the the older son. I will link that. It was written by a really good article that was written by one of our um, our male writers that we had at one time on the Hallelujah House. Um, and he has written a book, too. So I might even link his book in there. Now, I want you to see this. This son disrespected his father by asking for the inheritance before the man even died. Can you imagine your son coming to you and saying, hey, I want my money before you die? Okay. And he just, and, and what did the father do? He gave it to him. Sometimes God gives us things that we ask for, knowing that we are going to have to suffer the consequences of asking for that thing. Okay. And um, he sometimes he allows us to have it because he gives us free will, right? So, sure, the son takes the money and squanders it away on party and lifestyle and women and all what he, whatever he was spending his money on and frivolously and ends up serving the pigs. He's, he's dirty and he's covered in sin, okay? That's what I want you to see here. He's covered in sin. And he decides that, you know, I have sinned against my father. I'm going to go home because my servants, the servants that used to serve my father, he, they made, they had better food and living conditions than, I'm ha- than I have here living with the pigs. So he goes home and he's walking up the path. I want you to picture the father looking out the window. He's looking. He's been, he's always looking down that dirt lane waiting for that son to return because he knows he's going to come back one day. And when he sees him afar off, he runs to greet him. And he covers him with a robe and hugs him. And he's rejoice, He's rejoicing that he's returned, okay? And he feeds him. He feeds him good food. Puts a ring on his hand, all right? And, that, and that's what God does for us. He covers us. Uh, covers our sinful nature with his righteousness. That's why Jesus died. He, cover, he covers our sins. So God sees us as, our, as his child. We are his child. If, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are his child. And he looks expectantly when we, when we veer off into sin, which we sometimes do. But you never stop being his child. You never stop being his child. But he rejoices when you return. And he covers your sin. This, all the sins that you commit, while, even while you're out there. But when you come back and repent, he is rejoicing. Okay? All right. So I hope that you understand how we should view God as our Father. And I, I want to... Um, I want us to all get that straight in our minds and our hearts today. He is Abba Father, a good, good Father. All right, I'm going to close this in prayer. I think that's all I have for you today, all right? Thank you for joining me. 
Thank you, Father, for those that are listening, Lord Jesus, and I just pray if any of them are going through any situation, Lord, that you will draw them back to you, Lord, and give them peace. Fill them with your peace. Let them know that you love them. Help them to feel your love, Lord Jesus. If they are viewing you as any of the faulty ways that they view you, I pray, Lord, that they will come to you and that they will ask for revelation and that you will reveal to them the truth of your word and help them to get into the word, Lord. Help us all to stay in the word. I pray for them um, to go and have and have blessings, Lord, in their life, the blessings and, and their fruit grow, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, mercy, all of it, Lord, that help them to have that, your abundance. We love you. And we thank you most of all for dying on the cross and surrendering your life for our sins, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, that is all I have for you today. And I hope, I hope and pray that um, that this has helped you. I do. Um, remember, we are bi-weekly, so I will see you in two weeks.